that particular time, my boys had been murdered. I was being accused. I was being held in jail. Actually, for the first three days, they had kept me in a cell where I was completely nude. It was very, well, it was a horror. I knew that Devin was dead from the minute I got downstairs. I don't think Devin lived a couple minutes. I mean, I was down the steps too fast. So he pretty much died instantly. Damon, you know, died a little bit later. Well, when the verdict came back, and of course they had found me guilty, I just was in disbelief, uh, overwhelming feeling of disbelief. I could not believe that they had found me guilty. I remember is hearing a real light glass break, just a, almost like a wine glass or something real light. And I remember, I don't remember the amount of time that it took for me to hear the first scream. But the first thing that I heard was Dolly screaming, Devin, 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 Devin. I mean, she was just going over and over and over again. And when I get over to Devin, he's laying on the floor face up and he has these huge two gashes in the front and the top of his chest. And I see that the coffee table bent over. He has no... No life in his face. And I'm hearing what's happened, and she's screaming into the phone, oh my God, my babies have been killed, you know, I, you know, get here, I need an ambulance, I need, and I'm just hearing this hysterical, you know, going on, this hysteria just happening, and I'm sitting here thinking, oh my God, I've got to get air into this, this baby's body. And I go down to blow into his, into his mouth to give him CPR, cock his head back, and as soon as I did, blood just spewed out of his chest. Tyler Wichir told police an unknown intruder committed the crime, yet within 20 minutes of arriving at the scene, police already considered her to be a suspect. Tyler was later arrested and charged with capital murder. The prosecution claimed a minuscule piece of fiber from a screen door found on a kitchen knife in the house supports their theory that the killer must have been someone from inside the house. Prosecutors also believed Tully's injuries were self-inflicted and suggested that she was a selfish, cold-blooded woman who stabbed her sons because she could no longer satisfy her expensive lifestyle. The media hype that followed soon portrayed Dolly Rettier as a materialistic social climber who didn't care for anyone but herself. Based upon the evidence presented by the state, after seven hours of deliberation on February 1st, 1997, the jury found Darley guilty of murder. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. And today's episode that we're doing, A Mom on Death Row. Very good. So this is about the murders of Damon and Devin Routier by their mother back in 1996. An interesting case. I, I think the forensic science was really well done. Do you? I do. Okay. Well, let me just give us a little background. I'll share that, and then we'll do a couple of five-star reviews, and you can get to your beer. Okay. Okay. So in 1997, a Texas court found Darley Lynn Routier guilty of unthinkable crimes, the killing of two of her own children in cold blood. Now, the prosecution had painted Darley as a shrewd, materialistic young woman who, sensing that her lavish lifestyle was falling apart, had murdered her two young boys to get them out of the way. Darley's now on death row waiting lethal injection. The evidence against her was very damaging, leaving little chance for appeals. Her husband, who had supported her and defended her, ended up divorcing her finally in 2011. Now, back in 2008, Darley had been granted the right to new DNA tests, and in 2014, her request moved forward at the state level with further DNA testing performed on a bloody fingerprint found in the Routier house, a bloody sock, and on Darley's nightgown. So what we're going to do is we'll take you back to the early days of Darley and Darren's relationship. We'll go over the shocking and disturbing crimes, so brace yourself. I'm going to tell you now, it's not easy to listen to. And we're going to go over the trial, conviction, and appeals in the case. In this episode of True Crime Brewery, A Mom on Death Row. So let me just read a couple five-star reviews, okay, Dick? All right. All right. Always like to hear these. Well, they do give you a little boost, don't they? If you're feeling down, they make you feel a little bit better. <laughs> they do. Yeah. So I'm going to read this one by Kimberlew, and it's called, You Might Make Me Start Drinking, but K 
Kimberly means it in the best way possible. I love, love, love. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I love, love, love your podcast. I listen to your new episode and replay your old episodes. I'm not a drinker, but listening to Dick's description of his drinks makes me want to start. Uh-oh, Dick. Keep up the great work. That's a great review. Yeah, I think. And, and if you do start, remember, moderation is the key. Moderation is definitely the key. So, Kimberlou, welcome to the brewery. Welcome. And another one by College Kid, 226-3737. So, I don't know if this is a college kid that went to prison and that's his number. I don't know where that number came from. What is it? College Kid, 226-3737. Could be a phone number. Possibly. I was going to say his birth date, but there's too many numbers in there. Yeah, and they're all kind of older numbers. Yeah, yeah. he wouldn't be a college kid. <laughs> He'd be an 80-year-old. <laughs> he would, that's right. So he said, or she said, makes work fly by. So college kid says, I love this podcast. I've been listening to podcasts for only a few weeks, but this one is one of my favorites. You can tell the difference in audio quality with the newer podcast, which is much nicer. But I still appreciate listening to the older ones, too. Please keep up the great work. I love listening to you, too. That's a good one, too, because he's comparing it with other true crime podcasts, and he's liking us. That's a good one. Yeah, or she. We don't or know she. that it's a man. Right. right. So, yeah, so either it's a 22-year-old, an 84-year-old. Either way, I'm going to say, college kid, welcome to the brewery. Welcome. Come on down and have some beer with us. So what's the beer today? Today's beer is called 512 IPA, and it's brewed by 512 Brewing Company in Austin, Texas. And for those of you who don't know, 512 is the area code for Austin. Oh, So well, that's where it comes from. I wouldn't have known that. See? So the 512 IPA is an American IPA. And American IPAs are supposed to be a little more hoppy and aggressive than their more staid British cousins. So they are a pale gold to reddish amber in color. They tend to be hoppy, pine and or citrus hops, moderately bitter, medium bodied. And there's always a good malt background, which usually gets described as caramel or bread or biscuity in the, the description. So this one, this particular one, the 512 IPA, is a hazy amber color with a thick off-white head. It has an aroma of citrus, uh, a little bit of floral aroma, and some sweet malt. Tastes like grapefruit and orange. A little bit of caramel, a hint of pine. So this was a pretty good beer. It was, it was pretty well balanced. It wasn't a real hop balmy type thing. Nor, yeah. Nor was it too malt forward. Was, well, I don't like a lot of pine. I think pine has to be subtle or it's too much for me. It can be. Yeah. But this one was pretty good. It wasn't terribly bitter. And it worked well. So here's to 512 IPA. All right. Let's open it up and head on down. All right. We're going to do these in pint glasses. That makes it easy. Yep. Okay, Dickie, let's head on down to the quiet end. And I want to talk about a mom on death row. All right. Let's go there. It's a good thing we came here early tonight. Well, we planned ahead. Yes, because, you know, this is game six of the World Series. Could be a really big one, huh? Yes, it could be. I mean, if Cleveland wins, they're going to be world champs. Yeah. Cubs win, there's a game seven. Right. So this place is going to be rocking. Right, because these guys haven't won in a long time, you said. Neither of them have won in a long time. Okay. So I think if we can get this done in time, I'm going to be watching it, too. Oh, I'm sure you'll be watching and I'll be editing. All right. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. So a little background, okay? Okay. It's always good to have background. So I'm going to go back to the very beginning with this one. The beginning's always a good place to start, right? Okay. Yep. So little Darley Peck. She was the first born child of Darley and Larry Peck. Yeah. What's with the Darley? I guess she was a I mean, junior. Is like a family name or something? There's like 700 Darleys in this family. <laughs> I think there's two, but 700 is a little bit of an exaggeration. Okay. Okay. So she was the firstborn child of Darley and Larry Peck, and she was doted on as a child, along with her two younger sisters. Now, when she was seven years old, her parents divorced, though, and a year later, her mother remarried a man named Dennis Stahl. In her early teens, Darley was moved with her mom, her stepdad, 
her two biological sisters and her two stepsisters from where they lived in Pennsylvania to Lubbock, Texas. Now little Darlie and her sisters got along pretty well, and later they would say that the toughest part of their young lives was enduring the constant squabbling and the occasionally violent fighting of the parents. Well, so, yeah. Second marriage. Yeah. Not going well. Right. Now, after a few years in Lubbock, the Stahl's marriage fell apart and the girls were broken apart. And Darley lived with her mother and her two biological sisters. Now, despite a shaky home life, Darley seemed like a really happy young lady. She was outspoken, she was cute, popular, and some people called her a little bit showy. So what's that mean, showy? Well, lots of makeup, big hair, fancy clothes. She liked attention. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, boys were attracted to Darley. She was petite, very curvaceous, and flashy was another word they used. Showy, flashy. Curvaceous. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm getting the impression of a big-breasted, small-waisted woman. Yeah, I think kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Like a young Dolly Parton, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Now, Darren, he worked at the Western Sizzler restaurant alongside Darley's mother, Mama Darley. And she saw Darren as a bright, talkative, good-looking boy with ambition. And she thought, hey, he'd be a good catch for my daughter, Darley. <laughs> okay. So yeah. this was an arranged meeting? Yeah. So playing matchmaker, she introduced the two kids. And by all reports, it was love at first sight. The tall, dark-haired boy fell for the five-foot-three-inch Darley immediately and won her over quite quickly. Yeah. I mean, Darren was one of these uh, aggressive, self-starter type people. Yeah, hard so, worker. So, yeah, he yeah. worked hard and uh, made, made pretty good money. Yeah, yeah, his life could have been a really successful good life. Could have. Now, Darren and Darley dated in high school, and Darren was two years ahead of her. So when he, when he went away to a technical college in Dallas, they continued to have a long-distance relationship. This wasn't easy because Darley needed a lot of attention, and Darren worked hard to complete his computer technician program and get back to Darley as often as he could. Now, according to some of Darren's family members, they saw an unflattering side of Darley at the um, going-away party that they threw for Darren right before he left for college. So according to Darren's family members, Darley was annoyed that she wasn't getting enough attention at the party, so she walked out of it angrily. And when Darren didn't go after her to chase her and ask her to come back, she came back in a little while later, claiming frantically that someone had attacked her and tried to rape her. Now the ruse gave her the attention she craved, but she eventually admitted to making it all up. Okay. So it's kind of so, a, a so bad sign. Yeah, there's some kind of... Maybe not pattern, but a previous occurrence. Yeah, at least a mild pathology. Yeah. Yeah. Because if she wasn't the center of attention... She didn't like she that. She didn't like that. Yeah. Huh. I hadn't heard about that. Mm-hmm. So this revealed to Darren's family that Darley had a possessive and even a cunning nature. So did they try to get him to break it off with her? No, I don't think it. I don't think it moved them to that extent. wasn't It wasn't that bad. No, I mean it could have just been a little character flaw. They certainly didn't predict what would happen. No. So after graduating high school, Darley joined Darren in Dallas, where he'd been hired as a technician at a computer chip uh, company. Now Darley got a job with the same firm, and the couple lived together, and they were very good about saving their money. And they got married in August of 1988. And she was 18, he was 20, I think. Yeah, these are kids. These, these are really young kids. Yeah, but ambitious kids. Yeah. Well, at least one of them. Yeah. I, I think Darley was more interested in hitching herself to Darren. Well, that's another form of ambition, though. <laughs> okay. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. She still wanted to go places, even if she wanted to get there in a different way than he did. I'll give you that. So, so Darley and Darren, they relocated to a small mm -hmm. home in Rolette, Texas. And this is when Darren started his company. It was called TestNet. And what they did was they tested circuit boards for computers, and they operated out of their home. And Darley helped him with that. So they worked pretty hard at doing this in the home. Yeah. I mean, they, I was reading this in a book that was written, uh, and they, they worked really hard. Yeah. And 
made pretty good money doing it. They did. They got ahead quickly. So their first child, Devin Rush Routier, was born on June 14, 1989. And their second child, Damon Christian Routier, was born on February 19, 1991. So with two children and a home company that grew to the point where Darren bought space in an upscale uh, office building eventually, and the Routier's life seemed to be headed for the like the American dream, like everything was just going the way you would want it to. Right. I mean, he was making good money. Yeah. Of course, they were spending it quickly. Yeah, but they had two healthy, beautiful children. He's making right. good money. They're able to work together a lot. Yeah. They've got a lot of independence. Mm-hmm. It seems like a pretty good life for... We're talking about people in their early 20s. Really yeah. kind of remarkable. And, and they're doing really well. Very well. They're, they're doing well enough to move into a bigger house. Right. Yeah, it's a lovely house. So by 1992, their company had earned them actually a small fortune. So the up-and-coming couple, they had a house built in Dale Rock Heights Edition. So that was an affluent suburb of Rolette. And it was adjacent to Rake Lay Hubbard and the community of upper-class businessmen and women bragged of uh, crime-free streets and happy families. It's an idyllic existence. It seemed to be, yeah. Right? They're in love. They're young. Yeah, they got this nice house. But, you know, things aren't always as they appear. Well, of course. We wouldn't be doing this if they were. <laughs> yeah, right. So the Routier's home, it was of Georgian design, and it resembled a little mansion in the south. It had the classic porch. It had colonial shutters. It had actually a water fountain on the front lawn. It actually flowed water right in the middle of the front lawn. Right, that's something they installed after they bought the place. Yeah, so I mean, you almost could say it's a little tacky. Well, I would. Yeah, but a little ostentatious. Not the best taste, maybe. But anyway, you know, who cares? It was it was a nice house. It was. Right. It's, it's a beautiful home. Yeah. But also, Darren bought a Jaguar as a symbol of his success. He had the Jag. And he he bought a boat, too. Yeah. Because they had plans of using the boat to take people out for bachelor parties, bachelorette parties. um, Oh, that's right. They were going to start a business with it, weren't they? Yeah, so they thought. I forgot about that part. I guess it didn't turn out that way. No. But they had the boat. They had the space. They had the boat. They had the Jag. Right. They had another car. Yeah, so Darlie seemed like a happy, loving mother. But... I guess there was another side to Darley. So some who knew her claimed that she was very materialistic, actually. And going back to that party when Darren went off to college, she seemed like she had to have constant attention, especially from him. Right. Like, despite being attractive, she still had this low self-esteem that never really... It was a hole that was never really filled. (laughs) So Darley's detractors say that her need to be the flashiest and the center of attention, eventually overcame everything else in her life, including her love of her children. Neighbors complained, actually, that Damon and Devin, not far past their toddler years, were often left unsupervised and just roaming free. Where, around the neighborhood? Yep. Okay. And I I mean, you know, she's, the the pictures we've seen, she's this flashy bleach blonde, big-breasted bleach blonde. Okay, but let's not let's not be too judgmental about I'm, that. I'm not being There's judgmental. Nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm just saying, she was a commanding figure. Yeah, she. I think she liked to be to draw some attention to her looks. Right. Sure, we could and, say that. And she, I think, uh, from what I've read and learned about her, she very often dressed provocatively. I read that. Mowing the lawn in a bikini. Sure. Well, if you've got it flaunted, you know, on the other yeah. hand, there's really nothing wrong with that in and of mm, itself. Okay. Okay. You say so. I say so. <laughs> I do say so. I'm not sure. Okay. But anyway, the kids wandering around at their, when they're like three or four. Yeah. That's not I mean, cool. No. No. So she wasn't supervising and, and didn't appear to be interested in supervising them. Well, that's according to some neighbors. I mean, there are other family members and neighbors who would say she was a doting, wonderful mother. So it's really hard to get a clear picture. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, you could think some of these neighbors might have been jealous of her. 
and said these things. It's really hard to say when you're just getting the judgments of people in her life. Okay. I mean, that's not... I don't think that's... Ne that's neither here or there in the case, as far as I'm concerned. No, it probably isn't. No, we're not here to judge her that way. But there were domestic problems that obviously surfaced. Now, celebrants at a Christmas party watched as Darley and Darren argued violently when Darley had danced too many times with another man in 1995. So that's kind of a sign of trouble there, that he was jealous that maybe she was a little too flirtatious with other men because she craved attention. Well, okay. I mean, if, if it was me and you and you were dancing with some guy, I, I wouldn't be that threatened. Yes, but you're a man who's very secure in his masculinity. I, well, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, these are kids in their 20s. They, yeah, you know, how people can be when they're younger. Maturity brings more Absolutely. wisdom, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's unusual at all to see a couple in their 20s fighting over something like that. Yeah, you're right. I don't know what they mean by violent, if they meant they were yelling violently. I don't think there was any physical violence from what I could read. No, I, I think it was all. They might have just been swearing verbal. and calling each other names yeah. and slamming doors and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Fucking whore. Yeah, that's never that's never a good sign, but it's not violent physically. Right. So there were rumors of extramarital affairs also by both Darley and Darren, and they were also living beyond their means. So they bought a 27-foot cabin cruiser, and this is what they were going to start that business with. Yes. And they also had to pay for a space at the dock to board it at, and they did that at the exclusive Lake Ray Hubbard Marina. So they just didn't do it in some swimming hole. No, they went first class. They did. I think these people go first class all the way. Yeah, I you think know? they tended to. Yeah. Maybe a little more than they could afford to. Possibly. But like you said, they're young. And they they're young and they, they have haven't a lot. figured it out. Right. It's a lot to have when you're that young. Yeah. So friends who knew of the couple's troubles were really happy when Darley announced that she was pregnant with their third child. But after Drake, so the third child's name was Drake, after he was born in October of 1995, Darley suffered some postpartum depression. She started having mood swings, and that was pretty frequent. She had some dark tempers. She had some spontaneous rages, a lot of outbursts. So she had some trouble after the third child. It's it, a lot to cope with. It, well, it is. She's got three kids in five years or so, something like that. Yeah. Were they born in 89? Yeah, yeah. So within that, six years anyway. And and she's young to begin with. She's 26, yeah. That's that's a big burden. It is. Did she uh, get psychiatric help or th therapy or anything? I don't think so, no. Because I couldn't find anything. I haven't that, found anything about her being on medication or in therapy. Yeah. Um, But the state of their finances really didn't improve at that point either. So despite that they had decent profits from their company test neck, they didn't uh, really support the exorbitant lifestyle that they'd built up to. They were actually, you know, same old story, spending more than you're making. That doesn't work. Not a good formula, is it? No. I mean, all this money came in. They were young. They started spending a lot of money. And then when the money isn't quite as much, they're not really ready to deal with that. They don't have money put away. They don't have a savings. Right. I mean, they, they run into debts that they can't pay. Right. And Darley did not want to go down to a lesser lifestyle. Of course Probably not. Darren didn't either, to be no, fair. No, I, I think neither of them did because they got accustomed to the high life. Sure. And wanted to continue that way. Well, everybody does, but there comes a point where you have to be realistic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, they're young. Yeah. So in 1995, Tessnick grossed more than a quarter of a million dollars, and the couple netted a little over $100,000, which seems great, but their monthly expenses exceeded $15,000, and that was just bills. You know. So $100,000 a year <coughs> income, $180,000 a year outgo. Yeah. That's, that's math, a negative balance, right? The math on that doesn't work out, does it? Not exactly. And then Tesnick began losing some money in early 1996, and Darren became on he became unable to pay himself the salary that he needed to pay their expenses. And then creditors demanded some late bill payments. So, I guess one of the bad things to happen that might have been one of the 
things that kind of push their relationship into a worse, into a more desperate situation, maybe, was that on June 1st, their bank denied them a much-needed loan of $5,000. Now, you say much-needed, but from what I read, it was for a vacation. <laughs> but And, and $5,000 is kind of chicken feed. I mean, they, you would they think must have so. been in pretty desperate financial shape for the bank to deny them a $5,000 loan. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Right. Well, everybody that everything that I read said the Jaguar was in the shop, so they only had one car they were sharing. I think he he bought a used Jag. Yeah, but right? there's a lot of maintenance, and, and there's a lot of maintenance. They're always in the shop. That's what they said. Yeah, yeah. So I guess Darley sporadically kept a diary, and on May third of nineteen ninety six, this is something that she wrote where where it was interpreted that she may have been suicidal at that point. So what she wrote was, Devin, Damon, and Drake. So those are her three children. I hope you will forgive me for what I am about to do. My life has been such a hard fight for such a long time, and I just can't find the strength to keep fighting anymore. So she'd written that in her diary, and then she called Darren at work, because now his work was in an office building, and asked him to come home. Well, good. Yeah. Well, I don't know now if it was good. No, but I mean, if she's contemplating suicide and she calls her husband to tell him to come home, that's a positive sign. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the big picture. Like maybe if she'd done that, the boys would still be alive. Well, possibly. Although, who knows? Maybe it was a gesture. Yeah, it might have been to get attention. Right. Yeah. Because she liked attention. Yeah. So, that's a moot point to me. Well, I think it shows something, though. It shows her state of mind a little bit. Because otherwise you might think she's going along all happy-go-lucky. But here we see a little peek into her mind that maybe she wasn't so happy. Well, I think you can certainly say she wasn't so happy. But sure. I, I think writing that note and then calling her husband to come home uh, makes me think it was more of a, a gesture type of thing. Sure, I agree with that. It was to get attention. Yeah. She probably she wasn't going to really hurt herself. Which is what she wants. Yeah, yeah. So Darren walked in on her while she was writing this, and I guess at that point she broke down crying and confessed to him that she felt suicidal. But as far as I know, she didn't go and get any professional help for that. He just thought everything was fine after they had a little talk, and she cried on his shoulder, and then la di da everything was fine, I guess. Well, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of practice yeah. of medicine, you, you take those things seriously. Right. And, and you insist on getting some psychiatric help. Yeah. But that didn't happen. No. No. Because he probably figured, oh, here she goes again. She's got the baby blues. Yeah. You know? So a little over a month after that, Devin and Damon were murdered. And Darley suffered some stab wounds, including one that is said to have just been millimeters from her carotid artery, so it was near fatal. Right. Right? So her 911 call came in at 2.30 a.m., and she sounded sincerely distraught. She was screaming that someone had stabbed her and her children, and that her children were dying. So according to Darren, he'd been awakened upstairs by the sound of breaking glass, followed by his wife's screams, and he rushed downstairs to their living room. Now, Darley had been on the couch with Devin and Damon asleep on the living room floor at 11 p.m. when Darren took their seven-month-old infant, Drake, upstairs to bed. Now, De Darren, the father, so many D names. I know, there's it's, D, 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 D. Yeah. So Darren fell asleep in the master bedroom with Drake asleep in his crib. Right, and the... So they were upstairs. The, the thought was that this was one of the typical Dallas area heat waves, and it was cooler downstairs than upstairs. So Darley decided she'd stay downstairs with the two older kids. And oh, I hadn't heard that. I just heard that um, the baby woke her up a lot, and she'd sleep better downstairs. No, she was thinking that it would be more comfortable for her and the big kids to be downstairs in the Husband and baby could be upstairs. Okay. Well, that's two so, different reasons then. So don't they have air conditioning? Reason. I mean, everybody has air conditioning in those places. Yeah, I don't know. You'd think that but anyway, they would have air conditioning. But I didn't hear anything about that. All I heard was that 
She was having trouble sleeping because the baby would wake her up at night, and that's why Darren and the baby slept upstairs. Yeah. So that, that could be too. There's a discrepancy it was, there. It was because uh, it was so hot. It was supposed to be cooler downstairs. Okay. But anyway, she was downstairs with the big kids. Right. So when Darren ran downstairs after 2 a.m., his two boys, Devin and Damon, lay blood-soaked on the living room floor, and Darley's nightshirt was covered in blood as she paced and screamed for help with the dispatcher on the portable telephone. Now Darren rushed to Devin's side and saw two huge gashes in his chest. He attempted mouth-to-mouth, according to Darren, but after he breathed into his son's mouth, the air and spurts of blood left the child's chest because they were just massive wounds. And obviously they went through the lungs and no air could be sent to the boy's lungs for respiration, I guess. Right. Well, we'll go over some of the autopsy findings. Yeah. But, yeah, he he was uh, basically dead from the get-go. Yeah. So policeman David Waddell was the first officer to arrive on the scene. Now, Damon still had a pulse, according to Waddell, and he instructed Darley to lay towels across Damon and apply pressure to his wounds. So that's basic first aid, apply pressure, right? Right. But he said that Darley ignored him and just continued to scream that the intruder might still be in the garage where he had fled. So he found that suspicious because she didn't seem interested in helping her child. Yeah, I mean, she was more in- into the guys out there, possibly out there, you know, go find them. Well, that makes no sense to me. I know. Okay. Wouldn't you say, take care of my son? I'd be all over that, yeah. My baby's dying? Totally. That would be the only concern at that point. She's pointing the other way. Yeah. So there's suspicions right away, obviously. Well, I mean, not right then, but pretty quickly. Pretty quickly, yeah. People got suspicious of this story. Yeah. So he was soon joined by another policeman, Sergeant Matthew Walling, and then the paramedics came. So realizing that the attacker might still be in the house, the policemen did a thorough search. In the kitchen, they saw a bloodied butcher knife on the counter. Nearby was Darley's purse, which was latched closed, and some expensive jewelry, which was totally untouched. So that was another thing that was very suspicious. Right, so that would take out robbery as a motive. Right? Yeah, that or, pretty much. Or pretty much eliminate robbery as a motive because there's a lot of valuable stuff lying around that wasn't taken. Sure, yeah. So Drake the baby was upstairs in his crib and he was fine. So that's one good thing. Yeah. But little Devin was pronounced dead at their home. And Damon, who was barely breathing, he was given life-sustaining treatments. But he died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. So I think now is probably as good a time as any to talk about the autopsy reports there. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll do that, and, and there's just some other further stuff. Yeah. So, so sure. Devin is the six-year-old, the older one, and he's the one that was declared dead at the scene. And the autopsy results showed two stab wounds on this poor little boy. One was in the left upper chest, which perforated the chest wall and then the left upper lobe of the lung and then the pulmonary artery. That's just vicious. So he would would bleed out pretty quickly. Sure, yeah. The other stab wound was in the mid-left portion of the chest. And this went through the chest wall into the region from the, the, the ribs and ended up in the liver. Ugh. So he he got kind of a double whammy. I mean, well, the liver that ble- that bleeds like crazy. That, that's a big vascular organ. So, yeah. So he he probably died pretty quickly. I mean, once once you get to the pulmonary artery, that's not good. So like within seconds, minutes. Seconds to minutes. Yeah. So pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, but he still he he was awake. He would have woken up and seen what was happening. Don't you think? No, maybe, no, not maybe not, not necessarily. Well, that's. I guess we could hope. Yeah, but it wouldn't have made any difference. He, as soon as it that first wound got his pulmonary artery, I mean, he he would have been dead within seconds to minutes. Well, what I'm saying is, I hope he didn't look up and see his mother doing it. That he didn't have any idea what happened, and 
went right from a peaceful sleep to being dead. He probably did. I mean, he was face up. Yeah. But, but yeah, you would hope that. That's what I'm hoping, yeah. The other little boy, Damon, the five-year-old, was on his stomach, so he was stabbed in the back. And he had more stab wounds. So I, I don't know if you can tell who went first or not Yeah. from this, but uh, Damon had four stab wounds. One was in the left mid-back, uh, and it penetrated almost to his chest, and his front chest, anterior chest wall. Wow. So this went deep. And then the second stab wound was in the right upper back, which also went almost to the front of the chest. And each one perforated his lungs. Ugh. So he, he bled into his lungs. So there was no saving these boys, really? No. No. And then the third stab wound was in the right mid-back, which also gave him a perforated lung and ended up almost into the front of the, the chest. And the last one, same thing. It was in the right lower mid-back and went through all the way almost to the chest. So it sounds to me from the autopsy results or report that this kid had a tougher time. He he was really almost impaled oh. four times. Wow. And the other kid had a couple stab wounds. And I don't know, maybe the, the killer recognized that one or the other was lethal. Yeah. And then moved on to the other kid. No. But still, mm. bad, horrible, horrible stuff. What I had read was that it was the largest knife they had in the kitchen but you don't know the size of the knife exactly. Well, they have measurements. I mean, it, it was close to a two-inch wide or long yeah. uh, incision. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a, it was a good-sized knife. Well, but when I think of our knives in the kitchen, we have some pretty damn big knives. We just have like a standard set of kitchen knives. Right. Some of them are huge. And if you think about a little five- or six-year-old, yeah, no, like there's the, no surviving that. You pick out a carving knife. Yeah. which would give you a couple inch incision, those are long. Yeah. And, and they can go... They're I longer mean, than the the depth of the child's for a, body. For a little kid? Yeah. yeah. They can go right through. Yeah. Ugh. Now, the interesting thing, and, and I don't know, maybe you're going to talk about this, or I'm sure you're going to talk about this. That's all right. Go ahead. And I'll just mention it now. Okay. So, so here's these two kids that are horrifically killed, and... Darley was also attacked by her history. Yeah. And she suffered knife wounds. Yeah, tell me about her wounds. Now, how were they compared to the boys? No. And and again, I know you're going to talk about this some more. That's okay. I want to hear what you think. You're going to talk about this a lot. Well, the two things that I think was, number one, her wounds were more superficial than yeah. the boys. Right. So she had her neck slashed and her arm stabbed. Right. The other thing is that there's no blood on the couch where she was lying. Yeah. And, and that's where she claimed she was attacked. Yeah. So and I'll leave you to the rest of the discussion. But, I mean, I'm looking at this. Here's these two little kids, these poor pitiful little kids that are just brutally killed. And the mom who's sleeping next to them on the couch has just superficial wounds. It's very suspicious, yeah. And I'm sure the police thought that right away. I'm sure they did. Yeah. Now, as Damon was taken from the house, Darley was interviewed by the police. She told them that an intruder had mounted her on the sofa as she slept. And she'd awakened, screamed, and after she struggled with him, he ran away toward the garage. It was only then that she noticed that the boys were on the floor covered in blood and she hadn't heard anything of the attacks on the two boys prior to that. Which, so, which boggles my mind, if, if that's the story. Yeah. You, you don't wake up with your two sons being brutally attacked mere feet from you? Right. I mean, even if they didn't utter a word, you, sure. had, you had to hear something going on. Jeez. Well, I would think so. And this is someone who said, as we mentioned earlier, that the baby would keep her awake at night. So right. She, so she's a light sleeper. She was implying that she was a light sleeper. Yeah. Yeah. Now, paramedics applied steri strips to a shallow cut on her neck, and she was taken to the hospital for further treatment. 
The police remained at the crime scene, of course. A veteran of the Crimes Against Persons Division, Jimmy Patterson, arrived a little after 3 a.m. that night. Now, he was chased by a yapping Pomeranian when he reached the second floor of the home, and on the landing, the dog actually nipped at a patrolman's trouser leg, attacking him. And the dog didn't bark or anything when the intruder was in the house? Yeah, that's my Is point that there. The point? It's very suspicious. Yeah. I mean, even a little dog like that, they can be very yappy, very noisy, very feisty. Yeah, and you'd wake somebody up. So all this was happening downstairs, and the dog never barked or anything, according to both Darren and Darley. Right. This makes me suspicious of Darren as well. For, for that matter, yes. Yeah. I mean, the dog didn't bark, so he didn't know. But also, I don't know how much emotion could be going on downstairs that he wouldn't have woken up. Right. But he didn't. Well, nobody said anything about a dog barking, right? Yeah. but And the and dog wasn't down there. No. But he didn't hear anything of the murders downstairs. The or, dog? No, the husband. Oh, okay. I was going to say nobody interviewed the dog. We can't right, be the, sure what the, the dog, dog heard. The dog said, no, nah, I heard nothing. Sorry. Yeah. No, the husband said he didn't hear anything until he heard some glass shatter, and then he heard Darley yelling, screaming. So he didn't hear anything of the attack yeah. or the dog or any of that. I mean, that also boggles my mind. Yeah, yeah. That... uh he didn't wake up till he heard his wife screaming. Right. Yeah. So just like us, the police wondered why the dog didn't bark or attack the intruder at all. And the detective, a 20-year veteran of law enforcement, so he actually turned away and wept when the morgue attendants picked up little Devin's butchered body and zipped it into a black plastic body bag, said it was the worst thing he'd ever seen. Well, I'm sure, just, just from the autopsy report. I mean, that must have been a bloodbath. Yeah. God, I can't imagine how horrible that is. No, it's nothing I'd want to see. It's something you'd never get out of your head. Nope. No. Nope. According to investigators, the crime scene didn't match Darley's story. So that's the crux of it right there. She's yep. telling this story. It's not matching what they're seeing. Yeah. Right. Here's, here's what I think happened, and here's what they're looking at. And you can go back and forth with it um, on the book that we read, on things that we've seen. But the most interesting, which is kind of funny, is the little half-hour Forensic Files episode that we saw. No kidding. And that went so far into the forensics that it was just a no-brainer to me after that. Well, that forensic evidence was just so damning to her. Oh, I think it's impeccable evidence. I mean, it's just it really well done. Above and beyond what I would need, what I would need to convict her. Yeah. So, so what are some of those things? Well... In the kitchen, they thought it was strange that the sink was spotless and white, while the edges of the countertops and the cabinets in front of the sink had blood smudges and drips on them. So they did a luminol test, and the entire sink and counter glowed, showing that someone had cleaned up those areas. Uh huh. So that's, why would that have happened? There's no explanation for that with her story. That doesn't make any sense. None at all. So they repeated that process on the leatherette sofa, and all they found there was a small child's handprint near the edge where Damon had been stabbed. So someone had wiped off that as well on the sofa. Now, Darley had said she believed the killer came in and left through the garage, right? Right. And a screen in the garage had been slit. But that in itself was funny because it could have been easily popped out. It was one of those little pop-out screens. So you didn't need to cut it? No. And, you know, even if you let that go, it was suspicious that the screen didn't appear pushed in or out like someone had crawled through it. And also, they said that the dust on the windowsill was undisturbed, and there were no handprints or blood around the window at all. Mm -hmm. So the only bloody footprints in the house at all belonged to Darley. And pieces of a shattered wine glass that she said was knocked down when she was chasing him. By the way, who, what woman is going to chase an intruder out to the garage? I would never do that. No, I'd be running the other way. Right. right? I'd be grabbing my kids and hiding somewhere. Exactly. So, but anyway, pieces of the shattered wine glass lay among her footprints in the kitchen, and there was also a vacuum cleaner that was lying down on its side. But these were on top of the blood. Yeah, exactly. So this was done afterwards. Yeah, because the blood was underneath the glass and the vacuum. 
So that made it clear to police that they were dropped after the violence, not during it. Right. Which may, that just adds to the point that she was setting it up. Yeah. That the whole thing was set up afterwards. So what the police are saying is that, that since there's no blood on the couch where she was purportedly stabbed and the sink and cabinetry had been wiped down, they, they're thinking that she had stood at the sink and cut herself. Yeah, well, the, the footage from the Forensic Files episode, you could see that there were, there were solid round drops of blood in front of the sink, which would mean you're standing still because right. there's no direction of the blood. It dropped straight down. And another thing, which I think I have written down somewhere, but I'll just say it now, is that in front of the sink also, when they did the luminol, they saw her footprints, her bare footprints <laughs> that had been cleaned up. Okay. Bloody footprints. Also, as I said earlier, her purse lay undisturbed on the kitchen counter with several pieces of gold jewelry. Now, another weird thing was this bloody sock that was found 75 yards from their house. Yeah, that's interested me. So it was found, it had both Damon and Devin's blood on it, so the two boys who were murdered. It was in the alleyway, and where it was found was not a likely escape route. So they lived on a cul-de-sac, and there was a high fence with a gate that was difficult to open because it had some, the kind of wire you'd hang a picture with wrapped around a loose part of it. Yeah. So it wasn't an easy gate to open and close. So you're not going to just open it and close it. No, and there was no blood on it. And then the sock was down the alleyway where there was no easy escape route from. This alleyway was actually well lit, and there was no immediate access to the street from there. Also, why would an intruder leave the home with a sock? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So it was Darren's sock with the two boys' blood on it. And the um, the murder weapon, a butcher knife from their own home, was also left behind. So even in the 911 call, Darley had told police that she picked up the knife and put it on the counter. This seemed to be a big thing to her, more important than telling them about her children's condition. Right. Well, if if you're a cynic and you think, if you think that she did it, the... Uh you need to get out in front of the thing about my fingerprints are on the knife because I picked it up, not because I used it to murder my kids. It's just stupid either way, though. Well, I know. But she's she's saying that she's trying to establish the alibi. That, yeah. Oh, I kind of messed up. I picked up the knife. Well, their point is that someone who's really concerned about their children isn't going to even care. You're not going to well, think about not. that stuff, You don't right? even mention that stuff. Of course not. You're not even going to think about it at all doesn't even enter your train of thought. Mm -mm. No. So why would an intruder leave that sock there, and, but, leave, but drop the knife in the house? Another inconsistency. Yeah. So she told police she picked up the knife and put it on the counter. She said, oh, it was just an instinct. I don't know why I did that. You probably could have got his prints, but now my prints are on it. Well, they could have still gotten his prints. If he existed, if, they could have gotten his prints. If there was someone holding the knife. Other than her. Other than her. Yep. They could have lifted his prints, too. Yep. Also, she said that he dropped it on the kitchen floor, but another thing mentioned on forensic files was that there was no mark of a knife falling on the floor in the blood in the bloody mess. Not in the kitchen? No. In another room? In the living room there was, yes. Yeah, which was totally out of place with her story as well. Right. Yeah. And, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, this, this story doesn't hold up at all. In, no. In so many ways. But how did that print in the living room happen again? You remember the Some, knife? Yeah, the knife print in the living room. It was it was very specific. Well, the, the way it was described was she used she had carried the knife into the living room after she had cut herself and because she, one of the boys was still alive. Right, and she yeah. had blood coming down her arm over the knife, and when she dropped the knife, it left the the print. Yeah, because there was like a thicker edge where the blood right. had been dripping down. Where it was her blood dripping down. Which matched the location of her wound on her arm. Right. Yeah. So they're actually saying that one of the boys was crawling towards the kitchen, and she went back and stabbed him some more. Is that what they're saying? I don't, I'm not sure they said that, but I mean, she was carrying the knife back into the living room to see if everyone is dead. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But it, to, to me, it's just really elegant police work or forensic work. Well done, yeah. Now, what about this other kitchen knife, the serrated bread knife? 
<laughs> that was back in the in the block in the that's, kitchen. That's another good story. Yeah. Because there was a, a piece of nylon or something on it that matched the screen. Yeah, so there's a bit of the screen on it. Yeah. Yeah. So so if we're thinking, okay, the intruder took the knife. I mean this this is just too much to comprehend, but he <laughs> he grabbed the knife from the knife rack. The bread knife, the serrated one. Slashed open the, the screen and then put the knife back in the rack. <laughs> and grabbed the knife to kill them. With. And grabbed the knife to I mean, please. Yeah, well, that was super, but super anyway, strange. But anyway, they, 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 no they did find the, the piece of nylon that matched the screen. So they, they knew pretty much that that serrated knife was the knife that had cut the screen. And as you mentioned, it was a screen that was a pop-out screen. So there was no particular reason to slash it open, you could have just pushed it through. Well, and add to that that there were no marks of blood or anybody marking it up or fingerprints no. or anything about anyone crawling in, out of it or into it. Nope. Okay, so they would have gone in and got one knife, but how did they get in initially then if they took that knife to well, cut the I, screen? I know, it's just, the, the story is just ridiculous. Well, this is why when I read these things that say maybe she's innocent, it's just not believable to me. Not in the least. You can read. I mean, how how are you going to? So he somehow gets into the house to grab the knife to go outside and cut the screen and come back in? Yeah. Come on. Yeah, there's well, there's really no other explanation, right? I, I mean, it doesn't no, make sense. Unless the knife somehow had been outside. Yeah. And he picked it up to gain entrance. But it wasn't lying outside. <laughs> but, you know, these cops said if someone goes to commit a crime like that, they bring a weapon. <laughs> right. right. They don't use two knives from the kitchen. No. And leave them there. And leave them. Yeah. Both of them. Right. Well, it's just, it's too much. Because if you go to darlyfacts.com, which is the site that's pro-Darly and says she's innocent, they can say a lot of things like, you're oh, like, oh, wow, well, you know, that's a good point. But then when you go over this stuff, that's why I'm saying this Forensic Files episode was what did it for me. Well, yeah. The forensics were just I mean, incredibly, incredible to... To me, there's no doubt. I mean, the, the way they've re reconstructed it mm -hmm. and everything, no. No. She, she did it. Right. So Darley had a cut across her lower throat and on her right forearm, as you said. Police believe that she cut herself at the kitchen sink because the blood drops, like I said, they were circular on the kitchen floor. So that's indicative of someone standing still. So she said she ran through the kitchen chasing the guy, but the blood drops showed someone standing still or walking very slowly. Right. And then the wine glass and the vacuum were on top of them. They didn't have any blood drop on top of them. Yeah. The blood was underneath those things. Right. And they also could figure out when they, when they listened to the audio of the 911 call. Well, that was fascinating. That yeah. That when they took out the background noise, they could tell she was moving from room to room, which is... Staging the scene. Yeah. More. Even her husband who defends her says she was pacing back and forth on the phone holding a wet rag to her throat. Right. So she never got down and tried to resuscitate the boys or anything like that. Nope. She was staunching her blood flow. Yeah. And they believe that the, the rag she was holding to her throat, she probably used to clean up the sink as well. Sure. So also they brought in bloodhounds, and the bloodhounds couldn't track the blood past the spot where the sock was found. So they could they would find their way to the sock, but then they'd stop. Dead end. Okay. Which is very indicative that whoever had the sock went back from, somebody, where, from whence they came. Somebody put the sock out and then went back to where they were. Yeah, so this supported the police's <laughs> the police suspicions, obviously. Mm -hmm. The police were convinced that there'd been no intruder at that point. So I think it was within, I think it was the same night they said, hey, there's no intruder here. There's no sign of them. Yeah, I think they pretty quickly looked at the evidence and looked at the story and said, this doesn't add up. And interviews I read with the policemen is like, they wanted to find a sign of an intruder. No one wanted to believe a mother would do this. Well, of course not. They're like... Let's just find something, please. We don't want to think she did this. Because it's a horrible thing to think. It is. Yeah. So I don't think they had their mindset on setting her up to do it. I think people wanted to see her as a victim, but they just couldn't. Yeah, I think they, you, you're right. They, they were hoping that it wasn't true. But sure. there wasn't any shred of evidence that suggested otherwise. Yeah. 
So it was seven days after the murders. It was Devin's seventh birthday. So this is when Darlie and her family and friends, they had a birthday celebration at the boys' grave site. Now they said there was a somber prayer service beforehand, which we don't have on video. But there were balloons, and there was silly string, and there were gifts. And this whole thing was videotaped. And in the video, you see Darlie smiling, singing, chomping on gum, um, spraying silly string over her son's grave. It just, I don't get it. Yeah, it was, it was pretty damaging to her defense. It, it sickened people. Right. And they did try and explain it. Well, we're Christians, so we believe that they're in heaven now celebrating. But I just, I don't, I don't see it. And I'm sure most people don't. No. I, no. I think most reasonable people would look at that and say, the fuck are you thinking? Right. It's sick. Yeah. Yeah. So in her interview the day after the murders, she changed her story too. So she said that she woke to Damon saying, Mommy, Mommy, as he tugged on her nightshirt. She then opened her eyes and felt a man get off of her and turn away before she followed him, chasing him through the kitchen to the garage. So, you know, so the public's understandably horrified by this crime. And it was only 11 days after the murders that they arrested Darley. And the news that the killer of these two little boys may have been their own mother was just absolutely stunning to everyone. So the only thing that people really thought to compare it to was Susan Smith. That's the only thing really in the public eye. Yeah, well, it was recent enough that they remembered that. And Susan Smith, for those who don't remember, is the woman in South Carolina who put her kids in the car and drove it into a lake and drowned them and claimed that they had been carjacked by a black guy. And, and, and did hers, it apparently for a boyfriend. Right, and her story fell apart pretty quickly. Yeah, and she confessed. Right. But Darley has never confessed. No, she no. maintains her innocence. Yep. And at the request of Darley's court-appointed attorney, Darley's trial was moved to the town of Careville. And immediately after being incarcerated, Darley demanded that she be given a polygraph test. So I guess she thought if she took the polygraph, she could beat it. <laughs> yeah. Did they do it? They did. The results have never been formally released, though. Okay. But she said in some subsequent interviews on death row that the results were inconclusive. So. Well, at least she's not claiming they support her innocence. Well, I think if you did that, you'd have to yeah, you'd release be, them. You'd be crowing that it. all over the place, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. And so you'd release you, them. I passed the polygraph test. I'm innocent. Now, the district attorney's office decided to concentrate its initial arraignment against Darley on the death of only one of her boys, Damon. So holding the capital murder indictment on Devon's death in limbo, they could use it as a second-line support if she were acquitted or only received a life sentence on Damon. So they were set on getting the death penalty for Darley. Yeah, I'm just, I'm not sure why they didn't charge her with two counts of murder. Well, I guess I mean, they felt if they charged her on two and she got acquitted, that was it. But right. if they charge her on one, she gets acquitted, they have another chance. Yeah, but I'd also figure if she got acquitted once, she'd get acquitted a second time. But anyway, yeah. they, they went for the one. They did. Yep. So the last woman executed at this point in time in the U.S. was Velma Barfield in 1984. And that wasn't in Texas. There were 32 on death row in the U.S. at the time. The 30, 32 women? 32 women on death row in the country. Okay. So the prosecution began their case with Dr. Joni McLean and Janice Townsend Parchman, who explained that Damon had defensive wounds from fighting his attacker. So that's something you hadn't thought about. Was that in the autopsy? No. She said he had defensive wounds from fighting his attacker, and she described the differences between the children's mortal wounds and Darley's what she called hesitation wounds. Now, what's a hesitation wound? So that's a wound where you're not quite sure you're going to do it. So you, no, don't don't laugh at me. I'm sorry. No, I know what you mean. It's just funny the way you it's, said it. It's like <laughs> you start to do it and then you stop. Which is hard to wound yourself, right? Yeah. So that's what Darley had. So hesitation wounds are very similar or are the same wounds as self-inflicted wounds many times, right? Absolutely. A self-inflicted wound is usually a hesitation wound. Yeah. That might be the way to put it. I, I would do it, do it that way. Yeah. 
So what about all this business of the wound being only a couple of millimeters from her carotid? The defense makes a lot about that. What do you think well, about that? I'm, they said that, but I mean, the carotid, you have to go pretty deep to do that. So you have to make a really decisive incision to hit the carotid. So the, the fact, you know, they can say it was near the carotid. Sure, it was. It's in the neck. Right. But the carotid's in the neck. There was... She was never that close to the carotid. It was a very superficial wound. Well, see, my idea on that two millimeters from the carotid is that varies to the position of the neck, right? To the how tense you are. Yeah. The carotid moves. Well, I don't know. Who Plus, came up with two millimeters from the carotid? I don't know. Anyway. But, I mean, she's not someone who would I mean, know that anyway. You have to go fairly deep. Yeah. The, the carotid arteries are pretty deep in the neck. Sure. You'd be more likely to hit the jugular vein first before the carotid, and that would still bleed out pretty good. If you're more superficial, you won't even hit the jugular. So I'm not taking any credence into the, oh, two millimeters from the carotid, she could have killed herself. Yeah, you're not buying that. No. I'm saying she wouldn't have known anyway. Maybe she well, would have accidentally killed herself, but she wouldn't <laughs> have known any better. No, she wouldn't have known. No. So she was making a... Uh, defensive wound or a hesitation wound to give credence to her story. Right. And she didn't have any wounds on her hands. No no defensive wounds. No. And the boys' wounds were, you know, deadly wounds to their organs. Vicious like, wounds. Vicious wounds to their organs. I mean, she didn't have anything like that. She didn't the, have any deep stabs. No. No. I mean, the one kid who is supine got stabbed twice, but Got his pulmonary artery and liver stabbed, so he he was died or he's dead pretty quickly. Right. The other kid was on his back, so he got stabbed four times, but each of those inflicted a lot of damage. And sure. And then, then you got Darley sitting on a couch or lying on the couch who has just minor injuries. Well, some people say they weren't minor injuries. Well, they though. certainly were. They were okay. You really I mean, think so? Yeah. I mean, she was walking around functioning, and they put yeah. stereo strips on it, so... Yeah, I mean, they they didn't even say, oh, God, you need sutures or stuff. No, she didn't need any surgery or internal repair. No. No. I mean, when she got to the hospital, they did do some suturing. And they made a big deal saying that her necklace was embedded in there. Yeah. That maybe her necklace saved her life. <laughs> That's bullshit. Okay. It doesn't work <laughs> Tell that me how way. you really feel, Dick. I mean, if if you... Put a knife up there with enough force, the necklace isn't going to make any difference whatsoever. Yeah, I, I can see that. So, it doesn't, I mean, that's, that's just a defense's last gasp effort. Well, actually, with a knife that size, to cut like you did, you'd have to be from a distance and slashing to get that shallow of a wound, you would think. If he's right on top of her and he wants to cut her throat, he's going to go a lot deeper than that. Well, sure. That but, big knife. But if you're... Doing it to yourself, you're going to make a smaller incision or a less deep incision. Sure. So I guess everybody can tell where we're coming from here, right? Well, we're being objective, I think, but we're coming to the same conclusion. So, Officer Waddell, the first policeman on the scene, testified in the trial to the brutality of the killings, and jury members were shown the crime scene photos as he detailed the aftermath of the violence as well. So for two weeks, Darley was verbally torn apart as paramedics, nurses testified to her lack of apparent concern and her lack of emotion related to her children's murders. Paramedic Larry Byford told the jury that on the way to the hospital in the ambulance, Darley never once asked about the condition of her children. Huh. Well, I mean, she knew that the one was dead already, right? I don't know. I'm a mother, and I don't think it would be that easy. You're going to say, save him, save him, yeah. what can you do? How are my kids? Yeah, you're not going to say, oh, that one's dead, I won't even ask. That's, that's well, not what happens. She didn't ask about either. No, she didn't. And she didn't know. I mean, the, the younger one was taken by ambulance to the hospital. She, she didn't know he was dead. No. At the time, and she didn't ask about him. No, she didn't. But then officers testified to the evidence and the lack of evidence of an intruder in the home. So there was a blood expert, Tom Bevel, and he illustrated the velocity, the direction of the blood on Darley's nightshirt. And his finding was that her son's blood found on the nightshirt had been literally sprayed onto it, 
and he showed well, how that would happen in the act of her moving her arm up and down in a stabbing motion. Right. So I don't know. That's totally convincing to me in and of itself. Because no, I, I think I you think, can kind of... I think that is. You do? Yeah. And she's got her son's blood on the back of her shirt. How does it get there? By stabbing him. And raising the knife and stabbing him again. Yeah, and it was sprayed in an upward direction. They can tell by the direction yeah. of the blood. So, I yeah. mean, I don't, I don't see any other explanation for how she has her kid's blood on the back of her shirt because she's lying in the couch, lying on the couch. Right. And she's stabbed. So how does his, her kid's blood get on the back? Sure, I don't know. Well, you don't know because don't there's know. no other way except by her stabbing her child. Well, and that's what the that's what the blood expert said. And the prosecutor's final witness, FBI Special Agent Al Brantley, he first listed reasons why uh, he disregarded the intruder story. So first of all, he said the screen would it would have been easily removed. There was no need to slash it. Right. And an intruder would not go into the house, like this is what you said earlier, grab a bread knife, go back out, cut the screen. Go back in. Put the bread knife away. Yeah. And then grab another knife and go kill the children and then no. climb on the mother. I mean, it just boggles the mind. Makes no sense. None. And we know that robbery couldn't have been the motive because nothing was taken from the home. Okay. And the purse and the jewelry were right there. Brantley concluded by saying that the attacks were personal and done with extreme anger. And the children were murdered, obviously, by someone that knew them well. So this was, you know, by FBI profiling. This is the profiler. Yeah, this is what he said. That, that, that sounds entirely reasonable. What intruder I mean, is going to go and kill two kids for no reason? Right. Very unusual. And, and these two kids were just brutally, can't, can't emphasize it enough, just brutally murdered. Yeah, I mean, actually, the floor was damaged. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're an intruder... Even if you're killing the kids, you're not going to do it like that. Right. It almost seems like she was angry when yeah. she lost it. Right. So the defense brought in friends, neighbors, and relatives of Darley who vouched for her character. And Darley's husband, Darren, actually admitted to financial problems, but he said that his wife was truly devastated by the deaths of their boys. So Bexar County's medical examiner, Dr. Vincent DeMaio, he tried to lay doubt about Darley's wounds being self-inflicted and being surface wounds. Now, her throat slash, he said, had come within two millimeters of her carotid artery. So there you go. That's where you get that. And he also diagnosed the bruises on Darley's arms as mass trauma coming from a blunt instrument and not self-inflicted. So the thing about these bruises is that the nurses, the doctors, the paramedics, no one saw these bruises during her hospital stay. No mention. No, but it was two days after the murders that she went to the police station and showed them her bruises. <laughs> okay. And these are bruises. I mean, the whole underside of her arms from wrist to armpit were black. Really? Yeah. So she had someone hit her on the arm with a baseball bat or something? Something. I mean, that doesn't even seem defensive wound to have the whole underside black like that. It was weird. Yeah. Yeah. Plus... I mean, as you said, there's no mention from the hospital stay. And presumably, she was thoroughly examined. Yeah. Well, some people said, oh, the bruises hadn't really come to light, but it doesn't. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa All whoa, whoa. right, Dr. Dick, tell us how bruises work. They, they show up pretty quickly. So, I mean, if, if she had been beaten or showed defensive wounds on her underarms, the ER people and the hospital people would have seen them. Yeah, that's what I thought. There's no question. So guess who the final defense witness was? It was a surprise, and it was a big mistake. Darley. Darley. So why does, I mean, we, we know this from watching all these crime dramas and stuff. <laughs> you, you never, ever, ever let your client testify yeah. in their own behalf. Right. Because you're going to fuck up. And you're opening yourself up to cross-examination. Yeah, no Which, kidding. Yeah. But she insisted, apparently, on taking the stand, and that was against her attorney's advice. He definitely didn't want her to do it. Well, he's a veteran attorney. He knows. Well, it makes me think that she was kind of cocky. So Darley's attorney, Mr. Mulder, he guided Darley through her life story after she insisted on going on the stand. 
and had her talk about her dedication to motherhood, her ups and downs in her marriage. She actually read excerpts from her diary to show a thoughtful, deep person who cherished her children and had very strong Christian values. So, Darley explained the Silly String video, which a lot of people thought that worked against her in a very severe way. Well, you know, we saw that. Yeah. And and I would agree. Well, it was horrifying, but if all the forensics didn't go that way, I would have just thought, you know, that's tacky. I wouldn't say she killed her children. Well, maybe not that, but I, I would say it's more than tacky. Yeah, I mean, it's distasteful. Just, well, horrible. Yeah. I mean, you've you've lost your kids, two of your kids. Unbelievable. And you're doing this shit a week later? Right. Nah. But still, I wouldn't convict her for murder for that. If the forensics showed an intruder, I'd go with that. I wouldn't like her. I wouldn't want to be friends with her. But I wouldn't convict her. Yeah. Yeah. But you got other stuff. Right. Well, lots more stuff. Yeah. Right. So she explained the Silly String video as a celebration of the fun the boys would have had if they were still alive and were able to have this birthday party they'd planned. And then she recalled the night of the murder, explaining that if her story changed slightly, it was because the shock had left her memories all jumbled. So this really worked against her, this whole, I can't remember. Because she initially told the story of waking up with the guy on top of her, and then she changed the story to her son waking her up. But now she's saying she can't really remember. Right. And that, that usually means from the, the people that are expert at these testimonies means that she's leaving out critical elements of the story. Sure, yeah. You know, she's just kind of ad-libbing. Which means it isn't a real thing that happened. Exactly. Right. So in cross-examination, Darley was condemned, and she ended up lashing back in anger, which made her look really bad and unsympathetic to the jurors. Well, no kidding. You, yeah. You're supposed to be weeping and contrite and oh god i can't believe my babies are dead and she's going after the prosecutors bad move just showed that that's the kind of person she is Mm Mm-hmm. yeah good for the jury yeah but only after only seven hours the jury returned with a guilty verdict now do you have anything else there about her testimony i know you had some of her testimony in your Uh, file there well i don't really i mean just that there were inconsistencies and Things that worked against her. But yeah. I don't have anything that was that noteworthy. So it was mainly her saying that she couldn't remember. So then they had the penalty phase, and it ended three days later, and Darley was given the death penalty. Death row, because she intentionally killed her kid and could have been the killer of the other kid. Sure. But some people still believe that she's innocent, despite her failed appeals at this point. So in 2002, her attorneys filed an appeal for a new trial based on questions about whether her husband had a role in the killings. So the appeal didn't blame her husband for the crime, but it states that there was a conflict involving Darlie Routier's attorney, preventing the lawyer from questioning any inconsistency in Darren's account of the night of the murders. So what's that mean? That was was the attorney... The attorney for both of them? Well, he was an attorney for Darren in the past. There was a conflict of interest. Well, he should have recused himself then, if he'd already represented the husband at some point. Well, he hadn't represented him in crimes, but the husband had talked to him about not pointing the finger at him. Oh. Yeah. So it was all about... that's in the file. It was all about this case. Yeah. So he had... Yeah. I don't know. Why <laughs> Why would you say that he should have not represented you? Well, what they said was that he worked with Darren and he was going to use things Darren said to defend Darley, but Darren asked him not to and he didn't. That's what Darren said. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How far did that go? Well, it didn't go very far. Yeah. But it was, it was questioned. So... Darren Routier actually maintains that neither he nor his ex-wife are guilty in these murders, and claims regarding Darren include that he tried to get someone to steal his Jaguar for the insurance money, and that shows that they did have money problems. Sure, but that doesn't lead to murder. Well, sure, it does lots of times in life. 
And why, what were the grounds for divorce? I'd be interested in knowing. Uh, well, the divorce didn't happen to 2011. Yeah, but yeah. still, why'd they get divorced? Well... I mean, he's professing her innocence. Sure. So he said he wanted to just, he wanted to move on. <laughs> so, but, but he says she's innocent. Why would you divorce your wife? So also, Darren's father-in-law said that Darren came to him a few weeks before the murders and said that he needed money. He said he was broke and that he needed someone to break into his house and steal jewelry, furniture, and electronics and store them so he could file an insurance claim for the money and then get his stuff back and be back to zero as far as his debts. But that just stretches the mind so much. And so, so the idea is that he hired somebody to steal stuff? Well, he didn't actually hire someone. He mentioned it to his father-in-law, and he said that right. he mentioned it to people. And yeah. so the idea was that maybe someone broke so, in. So somebody decided to do that. Yeah, so he wouldn't have but been guilty. But they didn't steal anything. No. I know. I'm just telling you. Very flimsy. <laughs> okay. So the DA and others who don't believe Darley and Darren have said that they are using these ideas of insurance schemes to promote the idea that someone heard about Darren's inquiries and broke into their house and ended up attacking Darley and the boys. Now, Darren claims that he mentioned the schemes to a few people, but he never actually hired anyone. Yeah. Now, what about this thing where I heard two different detectives in different series that I watched or features that I watched say that Darren was inappropriate when they came about the boys? Like, one of them said that Darren mentioned how beautiful his wife was and what size her breasts were. <laughs> right? Well, he's pretty proud of those. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was super inappropriate. Right. Well, I'm still thinking that he might be exactly complicit with this, but he had knowledge of it. But he wasn't complicit. I mean, he, he didn't aid in it. Right. But he, co he was certainly helping to I'm, cover I'm things thinking, up. I think he's helping to cover it up. Sure. I mean, he seems like he I mean, really... This is just too much... Again, I know it's circumstantial. But sure. Well, he was never charged with anything, so. It just seems to me that how do you sleep through the murder of your two kids and the assault on your wife without right. waking up? Right. Well, so the 2002 affidavit of Darren is about um, helping her with her appeal. So he had told in his affidavit, he had said, In 1994, I spoke to a person about my Jaguar. In that conversation, I said, it wouldn't bother me if the Jaguar was stolen. <laughs> okay. So then, in March or April of 1996, he says, I asked my father-in-law, Robbie Jean Key, if he knew anyone who would agree to burglarize my home as part of an insurance scam. I said that I would arrange for my family to be absent from my house, 5801 Eagle Drive, and someone who I would hire would come to the house and take away the furniture and other items from my house, in a U-Haul truck, and that I would then pay the person from the proceeds of my resulting insurance payments. I don't know. Are there really are there really robberies where people take your furniture? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think they're more after jewelry and other that's, goods. That's heavy, you know, bulky Electronic stuff. stuff. Plus, why would you discuss that with your father-in-law for crying out loud? Well, these are the routiers. So this is what he's saying in his affidavit, which I kind of think all this is just to try and get Darley out of trouble. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. All well, this talk so about far, that's all I'm looking scam. at it as. Right. He also said between March 1996 and May 1996 that he told multiple people of his planned insurance scam. Now, another thing in here which I thought was really interesting, and apart from that, was that he says, and I quote, In the late evening on June 5th, 1996, I had a verbal disagreement with my wife, Darley Lynn Rutier. During that discussion... My wife asked me for a marital separation. Really? Really. That's a bombshell. Yes. You know. Yes. Yeah. So he also said, I first met with attorney Douglas Mulder. So that's Darley's defense attorney. That's her defense attorney. Yeah. In July 1996. He said, I met at least once a week with uh, Mr. Mulder. The subject of the meetings was Mr. Mulder's potential representation of my wife, Darley Lynn Routier and I and her in her criminal trial. So this is where we get into the conflict of interest I was talking about. So Darren said, I continued to meet with Mr. Mulder in August 1996. 
during one of the meetings I had with Mr. Mulder in August of 1996. He told me that the court-appointed attorneys in my wife's case, Wayne Huff and, Doug and Douglas Parks, had confided in him that they were going to try and portray me as the person guilty of the murder of my sons because they thought let's see, that I had something to do with the deaths of my sons. I told Mr. Mulder that if we hired him, I did not want him to go after me. Mr. Mulder agreed that if hired to represent my wife, he would not argue as part of the defense that I was in any way responsible for the death of my children. Well, so of that's course significant. Not. Well, yeah. That might have been her best defense. That he planned that it? That he did it. That he attacked her and the children. Yeah, but they couldn't do that. Well, because of this. If, if they didn't do it because of this I mean, agreement, oh, then please. she didn't get a fair trial. Bleh. <laughs> what does that mean? That, that means it's all crap. Really? Yeah. I don't know. It says, between July 1996 and late September of 1996... Darren continued to meet regularly with Mr. Mulder, and on September 30th, 1996, Mr. Mulder represented Darren at a show cause hearing, show cause hearing, before Judge Toll, where the state of Texas alleged that I violated a gag order in the criminal case against my wife. So he said, I believe, based on Mr. Mulder's comments, that he was my attorney, which if he was Darren's attorney and Darley's attorney, that's a definite conflict of interest. Well, no kidding. So that could have been a pretty good argument. But, Not that she's innocent, but that she didn't get a fair trial. But nobody's ever suggested that other than Darren. Well, Darren put forth the affidavit and it was disregarded. There was no right. new trial issued. Okay. So I think even though it might so be correct. So it didn't correct, work. Well, it's probably not correct, but. Right. I mean, it might be correct, but it's not going to cause her to be... It's not going to change the outcome of her trial, let's just say. Okay. Right? Okay, so in 2005, there was um, a finding for further testing on DNA evidence that was granted on the blood stains on the tube sock, on the blood stains from Darley's nightshirt, and on the partial rape exam performed at the hospital, which showed that there was no rape and also on blood stains and swabbings from the butcher knife, and there was an unidentified facial hair that was tested for DNA that didn't match anyone in the family. Okay. You know, big deal. Right. So they did do the further DNA, but nothing was changed. She still didn't get a new trial. Okay. Yep. So that's all. I mean, I think that the, dare, that the conflict of interest was valid, but I don't think it was enough to change anything. Well, I'm not sure it was valid. You don't think so? I don't know. I think we're just listening to Darren's side of it. Well, true. But if Darren actually thought that this guy was his attorney, and the attorney was purposely not pointing any fingers at Darren in his defense of Darley. Yeah, but don't you think that would have come out in the appeal? And nothing and, happened. And nothing happened. So right. I think it was adjudicated that it wasn't a conflict of interest, right? Sure, right. Or so, that it, if it was a conflict of interest, it wasn't significant to change anything, maybe. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if it was a conflict of interest, it would have been something that would be major. Perhaps. So they didn't overturn it? No. Okay. So back in 2000, the TV show 2020 did a special on Darley's claims of innocence. And one juror came forward at that point and said that he'd been peer pressured to vote for a guilty verdict. And now he changed his mind. <laughs> but I think this happens a lot with jurors. Well, and, sure. I mean... We all have selective memory. The time has passed. Yeah. Yeah. So in June of 2002, uh, Dr. Richard Jantz, a fingerprint expert, indicated that an unidentified bloody fingerprint left at the crime scene was consistent with an adult print, but it didn't match Darley or Darren's. And that's when they agreed to do further testing, but nothing else was found that it was, it was not a stranger, there was no further DNA found. And then in 2011, Darren did divorce Darley, but he said he still believes she's innocent. So he just said that he divorced her in order to move on because they were in this limbo state for years and years. And if you think about it, 2011, that's a long time they stayed married. Yes. Yes. So he must have found some, 15 new, years? some new woman or something that he needed to divorce her to marry somebody. Well, I don't know about that's, that. That's my cynical viewpoint. Okay. I mean, if, if you've believed in your wife's innocence for all these years, 
Why do you suddenly divorce her? Well, why is he married to someone on death row, though? You're not having a life together. Well, no, but you believe in her innocence. So sure, it doesn't mean you have to be her husband. You could be a friend who believes in her innocence. Oh, come on. No, seriously. No. Why? I think so. I, I wouldn't do that. Well, you're very loyal. I But mean, I would if, think that if I'm in prison for 15 years, we're not having any kind of a relationship. Go ahead no. and make a life for yourself, for God's sake. But you're my wife. Yeah, I wouldn't I'm, want you to destroy gonna, your life. I'm going to stand by you. No. For uh, as long as it takes. No. I'm, okay. We have no. different thoughts Maybe on that. Maybe not remarry, but you don't have to stay married to me. You don't have to, because... Well, if I'm not planning on remarrying, I would stay married. Well, true. You could. So... But, you know, they might have grown apart in that time that she was on death row. It's hard to maintain a relationship. <laughs> probably would have. <laughs> yeah. But still. Yeah. I mean, if, if you believe in your wife's innocence, you yeah, stay married. I see what you're saying. That's all. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, since 1998, five women have been executed in Texas. Just a little death penalty info here. Okay. Yeah. And Darley is one of ten women currently awaiting lethal injection in Texas. The U.S. hadn't executed any women from 1985 to 1997, but then since 1998, 13 women in the U.S. have been executed. So quite a few. Yeah. But as of today, there's no date set for Darley's execution. Okay. So I don't know how far in advance they set a date. Right. But she's sitting there on death row. Yeah. And I can't say for sure that her appeals are exhausted, but the ones that I have found have not led anywhere, so I'm thinking we're headed Noth that way. Nothing's worked yet. No. No. Now, she has her supporters who claim that her conviction was based solely on circumstantial evidence, which I can't see at all because the forensic evidence is I, incredible. I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that's circumstantial. I think that's pretty good sleuthing. Yeah. So I'm just going to let you know what the most recent statement from the director of the Texas Defender Service is regarding her case, because I thought this was super interesting. So I'm just going to quote it for you right now, okay? Okay. So if Routier's appeals lawyers didn't get everything in the record early on, they're out of luck. The number of people who are concerned about her innocence is much smaller than the number of people concerned about the amount of time it's taking to execute people on death row. So what do you think of that statement? Sounds like a pro-death penalty. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I guess that's all I've got to say about this case. Do you have anything to add? I think no, she's probably I where I, she I, belongs. I think we have the right person found guilty. I agree. You know, you, you hate to think that a mother could kill her own kids. Yeah, you, you but, don't want to believe that. But it, to me, it's overwhelming evidence that she did. Yeah. But I do think that Darren knows more than he's saying. Oh, no question. Yeah, you agree with me? Yeah. I definitely agree with you. Okay. All right. Well, she's where she belongs, so so much for that. She's there. Now, I'm told that Dick has an announcement to make. Oh, an announcement. Well, not, not a really. Yeah, I guess an announcement. Okay, go ahead. So we're going to do another contest. Woohoo! The last one was a big hit. So we had lots of input. We had a good last time con contest. And so we thought we'd do it again because we had so much fun the first time. So what we're going to do is give a prize of a True Crime Brewery t-shirt. Yeah, which is super cool. They are. It's great material, high quality t-shirt, cool these design. Are classic t-shirts. You're going to awesome. really want one. Yep, they're coming out around Christmas, so they'll be up for sale, but the person who wins this contest will get theirs for free. A free t-shirt. Yep. Can you beat that? Nope. Nope. So the contest is going to run from today. November 1st. To January 1st. Okay. Okay. And what I want from you folks is a beer review. All right. So I want you to pick a beer of your choice and review it for me. Yes. And I'm going to look at how well written it is. Because I'm a stickler for grammar. It's true. I want you to, to display some originality in terms of why this particular beer and how much you enjoyed it. And I want you to give me why you chose this particular beer. Because I'm going to respect your individual tastes, but I don't want you reviewing Bud Light for me. Because <laughs> I'm not even going to listen to that. No macro breweries. Nope. No. 
So, and I want the review to be spoken. Spoken word spoken only. Spoken word review. That's right. Which you can do in a couple ways. You can do a voicemail link at tigrabber.com. That's right. The right side of the front page of our website, there's a little block that says send voicemail. You click on that, you record your voicemail right from the phone or the computer. Right. Or you can do an audio file on your computer or smartphone and attach it to an email at truecrimebrewery at tigrabber.com. And I'm not worried about audio quality. No, we're not judging that because we know no. how tough that can be. We certainly do. <laughs> We've been through that stuff. So yeah. audio quality doesn't count. The other things do. Sure. And I'll be keeping people informed, but I'm going to pick a winner after January 1st. Yep. Obviously. Mm -hmm. So get those beer reviews in. I'm looking for them. Start drinking. Start thinking. And drink well. Yeah. And you can you can be creative. You can, uh, you know, do whatever you want with it. Make it interesting. The more interesting, the better. I think so. I think a big part of the judging will be originality and creativity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, it's the start of the contest. Let's see what we get. Starting now. Now. <laughs> okay. All right. Good night, folks. Yeah. Thanks for listening. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. And also, if you go to our website, do your early Christmas shopping. It's not that early anymore on Amazon.com. Just go to our website first and click on Shop Amazon and Support Tie Grabber. That's right. Amazon already has their Black Friday deals, so let's get I'll there. I'll do that. Cool. Yeah. Or you can go to um, tiegrabber.com forward slash Amazon. That'll take you to our Amazon affiliate link. And just do your shopping there, and that's a free way to support us. Also, we're still really looking for some Team Tie Grabber members to just fill out our group. Right. we got a great group of people, but we need a few more. So just, oh, we want lots more. Well, we want as many as I we don't can think get. We can't say we need you. No, but it helps because there are a lot of expenses that go along with making a podcast. Right, i got to buy these beers. We're not people to bitch about it, but, you know, we really can't do this without some support. So if you could join Team Tie Grabber for as little as $2 a month, that would be great. And you'll be a member, and you'll get special material pretty soon because I'm working on that. See. You could get yourself a snifter, a sticker, or a coaster. And we really need members, so if that's something you can afford to do, go ahead and do it. Let's go, folks. Yep. Anyway, it's great that you listened, and we'll talk to you soon. And I hope that a lot of people will join in this contest, because I can't wait to hear the beer reviews. Oh, I can't either. It's going to be a lot so of fun. I hope I get hundreds of beer reviews, so it's a really tough oh. time to judge who's oh, the geez, best. Hundreds, I don't know. Hundreds. I'm looking for hundreds. So oh, let's geez. get going, guys and girls. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks again for meeting us at the quiet end, and we'll talk to you soon. Let's play ball. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.